Um, I'm going to have a, uh, a uh, little moment of levity in my introduction, but it'll end the serious. So just a little heads up. Yeah, do good. We need levity, levity, especially now, Arlie. Yeah. yeah. And as we're waiting for the next couple moments, we can all just stretch ah, for levity. Yeah. And get our bodies yeah. grounded for this. This. You know, I remember one time, uh, Bob, uh, you and I were meeting for coffee, and you uh, ended by telling me this hilarious joke just to get my spirits back up and to get my emotional balance going. Do you remember the joke about the obese guy who had offered a great big piece of extra pie? You had me laughing all the way home as I walked. I'll have oh, to was that, that was the Monty Python skit. Yes. You know, if I have another piece, I'm going to burst. That's the one. And he burst. Yes. <laughs> was a, actually, I, that was a, the Monty Python, I, I still think, uh, oh. were among the funniest. Yes. You know, there's something about that British dry humor. Yes. Uh, John Cleese and who else was that Monty Python? Anyway. I have forgotten all about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I went in with such a heavy heart, the world was going to hell in a handbasket, and you sent me off laughing about this. <laughs> oh, he's so, got one. Sometimes, but, sometimes the, the best thing we can do is tell jokes or at least laugh. Yeah. It's, I'm trying, it's I mean, looking at what's going on today, it's very hard to come up with much that is funny, uh, that is not at least dark humor. That's right. That's right. So that's an extra thing we should do besides stretch. Yes. Right. Tell jokes. On our spirits. So why don't we spend the hour telling jokes? <laughs> there, there's an idea. Well, yeah. And there would have to be yeah. another joke, though. Another hour to bring us back to reality. Yeah. Well, with that, let's all, let's all, you know, ready our jokes for, for, uh, for telling along the way, but I want to get us started. Hi, everyone. My name is Andy Gaines, and I'm the executive director of Ashby Village. Very, very delighted to have you all with us today. Um, Ashby Village is a community-based nonprofit organization hosting this event. Ashby Village connects us with one another, offering support and opportunities for meaningful experiences that empower us to age in our communities with a sense of belonging and dignity. In this time of great social, political, and environmental unrest, I'm so honored to welcome Robert Reich to speak with us today. Robert is an incredibly insightful commentator who helps draw the curtain back on critical issues facing our country. Today's event is, co is a co-production of the Ashby Village Arts, Arts and Culture Series and Elder Action. The Ashby Village Arts and Culture Series began in 2017 offering food for thought for our members and the broader community. And since 2018, Elder Action has been a vehicle for our members and others to act actively pursue social justice. Although these events are free for all of us to attend, Ashby Village relies on donations in order to bring our programs such as this to our members and friends. I wanna bring your attention to the chat box where we placed a link to a simple way you can make a donation at your leisure. We thank you for your contributions. And the chat box is along the, the bottom line of your screen. We're also testing out a new closed caption tool for the hearing challenge. At the right of the chat box, you should see closed captions. And if you click that link, captions should appear on your screen. So in March of 2017, UC Berkeley sociology professor Emerita, noted writer and Ashby Village member Arlie Russell Hochschild, kicked off Ashby Village's arts and culture series with a talk about the nonfiction New York bestseller and National Book Award finalist Strangers in Their Own Land, based on five years of immersion research on Louisiana Tea Party supporters. She's long focused on the human emotions underlying our moral beliefs, practices, and social life, and on what she calls emotional labor. Today, she rejoins us to introduce her esteemed former colleague. Uh, following Robert's talks, we'll have, we'll have time for questions and answers. Please put your questions and comments in the chat box. 
Uh, Meryl Gearhart, an Ashby Village volunteer, our technology team chair and member of Elder Action, will be moderating them for Robert. And now, with further, without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Arlie. I, I am very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Robert Reich, who is, as many of you know, a truly Renaissance man. For starters, he's an inspired educator, schooled at Dartmouth College, at Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and at Yale, where he trained as a lawyer. Bob has gone on to teach at Harvard, Brandeis, and here at UC. Not long ago, I sat among 800 UC undergraduates to hear a riveting lecture on the rising salaries of Washington lobbyists. The waiting list at that point for his class was uh, 1,200, and it's, it's rising. Uh, but the very same Bob Reich is also an author of 19 books, many New York Times bestsellers, and some of these work in the proud tradition of the muckraking scholars like Lincoln Steffens or the novelist Upton Sinclair. His newest book, appearing in March of this year, is called The System, Who Rigged It and How We Fix It? An open letter to Jamie Dimon, the billionaire chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase. But wait, not only educator and author, Reich has also served as a prominent public official under Presidents Ford, Carter, Clinton, the latter as Secretary of Labor, and he was part of the economic transition advisory team for Barack Obama. This public official also himself entered a race in 2002 for the governorship of Massachusetts, doing very well. Educator, writer, public official, political candidate, Bob has also thought out of the box with regard to various modes of expression, books, blogs, videos, documentary films, talks. And there was one more mode of expression that I think we have yet to see for Bob. It's a mode of expression used to celebrate another Renaissance man. This other man was born in 1755. He was also trained as a lawyer. He was also a moral leader in an effort to abolish the slave trade. He was also a writer, and he wrote most of the Federalist paper. He was also a political official, the nation's first secretary of the treasury, yes. Alexander Hamilton. So for Bob, I think the next step should be a Berkeley rep and then on to the sellout Broadway musical with maybe a dueling scene, no bodily harm, uh, with Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan <laughs> Chase. Um, but to end on a less light note, let me add that just as Hamilton in real time struggled mightily to guide the nation through tumultuous times. So our public figure is trying in a parallel way to our, offer us the moral compass we need for our own tumultuous times. And so it is a great honor for me to introduce uh, and give you Bob Reich. Well, Arlie Hochschild, what a lovely introduction. Uh, it's the first time that I've ever been compared to Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and uh, the first time anybody has suggested that I actually go on stage with Jamie Dimon. Uh, you are really something, Arlie. And uh, the more I have got and had the privilege of getting to know you, uh, the more I absolutely adore you. Uh, so let me just uh, thank you, Arlie, for uh, getting me involved today. I mean, you were the catalyst uh, with regard to putting Andy and Suyin and Rochelle and Merrill, Merrill and me together. And so uh, thank you for that. And uh, Ashby Village, let me thank you for uh, coming today. Uh, these are really, I mean, really lousy times. Let's be very, very clear and candid about it. Every time I feel like we've got to the lowest point of the low points, something else happens that makes me feel like uh, the, the floor has disappeared and I'm tumbling down another flight. Uh, you know, the, uh, the death of Ruth 
Bader Ginsburg was not unexpected, but it was unexpected. I mean, she was such a rock. She was so, she was somebody that uh, I know that uh, almost subconsciously I assumed was going to be there and fighting the good fight. Uh, and her death uh, not only was untimely, but it was untimely in all kinds of ways, obviously, because uh, since then, since Friday night, uh, well, obviously, Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell have been doing what they were likely to do. And we learn uh, even today that Mitt Romney, although Mitt Romney, I think, uh, was a man who thought for himself. Obviously, Mitt Romney has succumbed to the same, uh, well, the same hallucinogen, let's call it that, whatever it is, uh, and will vote in uh, the next Trump Supreme Court justice, uh, leaving uh, a Supreme Court with, uh, with six Republican appointees. The reason I want to give that adjective, Republican appointees, is because it is significant. It shouldn't be. It never used to be. Uh, when I, um, Arlie, I don't know if you know this, but there was a time in my life when I briefed and argued uh, cases before the Supreme Court representing the United States. Uh, and when I did that, uh, the court was not really Democrat versus Republican. The court was a bunch of people who had been appointed by Republican or Democratic presidents, but the court really was regarded uh, in those ancient times, this was in the 1970s, it wasn't that long ago, as uh, being objective and neutral and respected. Well, uh, now I can't say that that is necessarily the case. Uh, many people still respect the court as an institution, but it's becoming more and more politicized. Uh, to have a sixth Supreme Court justice nominated by somebody who himself uh, did not get a majority of the popular vote, uh, who himself uh, was uh, impeached by the House uh, and nominated and confirmed by uh, a Senate uh, the majority of whom, Republicans that is, uh, represent 15 million fewer people than the Democrats in the Senate even today. Uh, and uh, well, it could go on and on to a Supreme Court that is likely to deal with not only the issues such as the Affordable Care Act and whether that continues, but also perhaps the election itself given the likelihood that there are going to be appeals uh, on both sides. So you get this compounding effect of partisanship, uh, the compounding effect of, of conflicts of interest, if you will, uh, the compounding underlying lack of trust and cynicism that we have seen develop not only during the Trump administration, but I think it's fair to say the Trump administration is in some ways the culmination of years, of decades, of growing cynicism about our institutions of governance, about our democracy. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. I'll go on for about, uh, let's say, oh, I don't know, another 15 or 20 minutes, uh, and then I will open it up to your questions. And we'll get into some of the details that you may be interested in. Well, let me, where, where to begin? I, I think probably the best place to begin uh, is uh, 45 years ago, uh, or maybe close to 50 years ago. Uh, I graduated from college in 1968. Uh, some of you may remember the year 1968. It was a year in which uh, many of us thought uh, things couldn't go more haywire, that the entire institutional structure of the country was getting off track. Uh, and, and the sociology of the country was also uh, coming under enormous pressure. Our cities were burning down. Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. Uh, in June, Robert F. Kennedy, the person I had been closest to, I had worked for him, uh, was himself assassinated. Uh, and then you had additional tumult that year. People who, the, the people were at each other's uh, throats and necks and there was violence. Uh, the Democratic Convention was one of the most tumultuous and uh, incendiary that I ever remember. Uh, people in Chicago, uh, young people were fighting each other. Uh, Mayor Daley, you remember Mayor Daley, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the, 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 the social fabric was really coming undone. Uh, 
Uh, meanwhile, millions of young men were in danger and really in danger of going to Vietnam. I had friends uh, who were going. I was worried about going until, uh, well, in fact, I was inducted. I, I, was, I got my induction notice that year, and I happened to be um, just out of sheer perversity. I was in Berkeley uh, working that summer of 1968. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, maybe I'll just go down to the Oakland Induction Center. I must be too short. I mean, I'm, I was less than, and still am, less than five feet tall. And I read in the Army Manual, you had to be five feet at least. And so I thought with a lot of confidence that I could just go down to the Oakland Induction Center and they'd, they'd say, you are, you are, you're not going to be inducted. You are too short. And I remember the day I walked down there uh, feeling, you know, brimming with confidence that I would not have to go to Vietnam. And in, there was nobody else there at this particular moment. And in the distance, I saw the examining sergeant behind a desk. And he looked up, and he saw me coming toward him. And he got a big grin on his face. His face turned, actually, into this giant uh, sort of Cheshire cat grin. And I got up to the table, and he said, um, you, you are exactly what I've been looking for, a tunnel rat to go under the, the tunnels, under the rice paddies, and flush out the VC with hand grenades. And I saw my entire life floating by me, and I thought, well, that, that's the end. That is the end. I'm going to Vietnam. I'd already lost a, a friend, a good friend in Vietnam. Uh, and it didn't, you know, now looking back on it, it sounds a little funny, a little humorous. It was not humorous at, at all. Uh, but then I, I, he said, we have to actually take your height. And we went to one of those, you know, those little height mechanisms where the thing comes down on your head. Uh, and I, I knew he could lie. He could just put down five feet. But I, I felt his, his hand on my shoulder and he said, I'm sorry, son. I didn't know whether he was sorry that I was five feet or sorry that I wouldn't be admitted. And he said, you're too short. And then I had a dilemma because I didn't know whether to, to roar with, with just, uh, with cheer, with, with, and, and because I didn't, want to, and I didn't want to make him angry and then maybe he would make me five feet tall. Uh, and so I, I just looked down, kind of downcast. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, I can't look too downcast because if I look too downcast, he might come back and he said, oh, okay, I'll let you in. So I was in a complete quandary. It wasn't a moral dilemma. It was just a kind of a dilemma with regard to what I was going to do strategically at that moment. Uh, but uh, long story short, I walked out and that was the end of that. It was a terrible year. At the end of that year, 1968, uh, Richard Nixon was elected president. So uh, for all of you who remember 1968, you remember it just didn't seem like it was possible to get worse uh, in many respects. Uh, and then the following year was Kent State. And then we, uh, we of course, went on and on. We went into the Watergate and we went into, I mean, the, you know, if you look at the history of this country over the last 50 years, you, you see a country that has been under greater and greater stress. I want to emphasize for the purpose of this talk, however, one stress point that I don't think gets enough attention. And that is the following. Starting 50 years ago, the median wage in the United States, and by median wage, I'm talking about halfway between the top and the bottom, the median wage began to stagnate. Adjusted for inflation, the median wage today, the person smack in the middle of the wage ladder, is not much higher than it was in the late 60s. If you Look back 40 years to 1980, the median wage is just almost exactly what it was in 1980. Now, the interesting thing about all of that is that the United States economy is more than twice as large as it was in 1980, uh, certainly much larger than it was, more than twice, much more than twice it was in 1968. So the question must arise in your heads, what happened to all the money? What happened to all the growth? What happened to all of the bounty of that enormously bounteous economy? If wages were stagnant, at least the typical wage, where did all the money go? Class?
Well, the answer is uh, that it went to the top. In fact, uh, a new study, a study actually that came out last week from the RAND Corporation, uh, one of the best studies I've seen, uh, and I'll let you have the citation uh, if you'd like, uh, that study shows that almost all of the gains, certainly over the last 40 years, and potentially over the last 50, from the economic growth have gone to the very, very top. Uh, we have now come to a point where the top one-tenth of one percent, the richest one-tenth of one percent, has almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent of Americans put together. Now, that's extraordinary. We haven't been anywhere near this since the Gilded Age of the late 19th century. And the reason I bring this up is because I think that as I look back over my career and what I've done and what other people have done and uh, what has happened in this country, I realize that when wages began to stagnate, Americans began to use one of three, eventually three coping mechanisms to handle the fact that they were not doing well, that they were not rising in tandem with what the economy could provide. Because you see the history of most people's living memory, certainly starting with the Second World War, was that as the economy grew, grew everybody grew in tandem. Everybody did better and better. That was my parents' experience in the 1940s, 1950s, and early 1960s. So what Americans did with this new reality of stagnant wages is they used three coping mechanisms. The first coping mechanism was women moved into paid work. Now, women were always working, and poor women were working in paid work as well as non-paid work. Um, and Arlie knows this and has done some wonderful research and writing about this. But what happened in the late 70s and 1980s is that women went into paid work in huge numbers not because there were all these opportunities open to women. I wish it were. I wish it were because of women's liberation and all these wonderful things. No, the reason that women, most women went into paid work starting then is because male wages were actually dropping. Mm -hmm. Typical male wages, particularly for those without a college education, most men, their wages starting, started to drop. Uh, and women, therefore, had to go to work to maintain family incomes. Uh, and, and that first coping mechanism worked for a while. Uh, but it was exhausted by the mid-1980s, or certainly by 1990. Let's, but to be safe, I want to be absolutely clear about the data. But probably by 1990, you could say that that first coping act was, was exhausted because there was only a limit to how many, how many women could go to work and, and, and whether it was a, a worth it to them, given childcare uh, costs and given all the other costs uh, that that entailed. Uh, and so the coping mechanism, what, number two, was everybody worked longer hours. Uh, and I remember when I was Secretary of Labor, I used to look at the data and be amazed uh, at the number of hours uh, families were putting in, men and women, working all hours. Uh, and uh, I remember at the time I was I was uh, I was looking at the data with with several other people, and we were I was trying to figure out how it was possible for most families to have this much working hours. Uh, and still maintain their families. Uh, and uh, I remember a friend of mine uh, came up with the acronym DINS, D-I-N-S, uh, which stood for double income, no sex, uh, which actually, you know, was, was humorous at the time. But, uh, but, but many, many families, men and women were working on shifts. Uh, they, were, they were trying to do the housework. Again, Arlie, I want to compliment you about the wonderful work you've done in this area too. Um, and uh, and it, it didn't work. That coping mechanism, that second coping mechanism, eventually uh, came to an end. It was exhausted because there's a limited amount of 
a time. You just can't keep on putting in more time. You come to an end. The third coping mechanism, uh, which we saw in the early part of the century, uh, between 2000 and 2008, was to use homes as piggy banks. And that's what American families did. They, they, essentially, uh, they essentially got refinanced for their homes because home values were going up. Everybody assumed home values would continue to go up. So there was refinancing um, uh, going on or using the homes as collateral for loans. A, a lot of, a uh, huge amount of money uh, was taken out of homes uh, and put into the middle class. Uh, and I think in retrospect, the middle class used this money, not only for the purposes of buying a lot of stuff, but also psychologically. Uh, as they use the first two coping mechanisms uh, to maintain their sense that they were still rising, that they were still on a trajectory that they expected, that their parents had been on. And that's where the financial crisis of 2007, 2008 comes in. Because it was at that moment that the third coping mechanism exploded. Uh, you know, uh, it, it wasn't only that people uh, could no longer refinance their homes and so on. It's also that millions of people, as a result of that financial crisis, lost their homes, uh, or they lost their jobs, uh, or they lost their savings, or all three. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that began a period of time in which I think there was a shift, a profound shift in the political sociology of this country. Because it was in the years following the financial crisis, after the banks got bailed out and not a single executive uh, went to jail of the, of the major banks, even though the banks did actually do a lot of gambling, uh, and I think to this day are still responsible. There were a lot of responsibility. A lot of people were, and a lot of institutions were responsible. The big banks really were mostly responsible. Uh, I think it was from those years, right after the financial bubble burst, that we can date the real anger and cynicism that began to take over the country. Because remember, wages still didn't rise. But you had, in the wake of the financial crisis, the realization by the vast middle class that they were not getting ahead. Uh, the three coping mechanisms were over. There was no other coping mechanism. There was no other way of, of pretending that they were getting ahead. Uh, and on top of that, you had this calamity of the Great Recession and what that Great Recession did. So it shouldn't be surprising that we had a movement on the left and a movement on the right, very uh, angry movements. Uh, the movement on the left briefly was called the Occupy Movement. The movement on the right was called the Tea Party Movement. There was a lot of overlap in the, uh, the things that got people angry. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of talking about rigging of the, of the economy, the rigging, the, gover the kind of crony capitalism, uh, the kind of uh, corporate welfare, the, the, the ways in which government was in cahoots with big corporations. It was a, it was a, a kind of a populist revolt both on the left and the right, slightly different focuses, uh, and they ended differently. Uh, the Occupy movement petered out because there was no political strategy at all uh, connected to it. Uh, and the Tea Party movement was co-opted by the Republican Party, by elements in the Republican Party. Uh, and it, no, it lost its, its kind of uh, initial groundswell, its grassroots qualities. Well, then what? Then what happened? The, the next chapter is a direct lineal descendant of those two movements. Uh, and I remember in 2015, I was doing some research that led to uh, my most recent book. Uh, and I was going, uh, doing research out in uh, North Carolina, Missouri, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, the Rust Belt, uh, and a few other places. And I, I would conduct, uh, not in, every, in, a, in a particularly scientific way, they were free-floating focus groups. I would have discussions with people. Uh, 
and I would ask people about their jobs. Uh, some of these people I had met years before when I was Secretary of Labor, and they would bring their families, and I would meet their children, and it was all rather nice. I enjoyed it immensely, but one thing surprised me, uh, in fact, even shocked me, because it was two, 2015, and I would say or ask these people, who do you think uh, you will support in the 2016 election. Now, remember, this was a full year before the 2016 election, but there were a lot of uh, candidates, uh, not a lot. On the Republican side, there were a, a lot beginning to fulminate. Uh, Jeb Bush was still considered to be the favorite. Uh, on the Democratic side, uh, Hillary Clinton was the obvious favorite in 2015, uh, but Bernie Sanders was coming up. Uh, and what I got back from these working class families, when I say, when I said in 2015, who do you, who are you interested in? I was surprised at the number of them who, without blinking, said to me, well, either Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. And the first time I heard that, I thought I was hearing things. I, I said, are you, how can you use those two names in the same sentence coming out of the same person's mouth. I mean, the, these two, these are two creatures that are on opposite ends of humanity. I mean, how can you possibly uh, think Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump? And the discussion that ensued was always interesting. And it always had something to do with the fact that Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump would shake things up. There was a lot of reference to how the economy had been rigged for the wealthy, for the establishment, for the comfortable, for the elites. And what I kept on hearing, and Arlie, when I read your, uh, your book, uh, I, I really did hear very, very uh, kind of comments that were parallel to, Arlie, what you, what you had found uh, in Louisiana. Uh, I was in the Rust Belt and I was in the South uh, and other parts of the South and Midwest. Uh, but uh, the anger against the unfairness of the rigging of the system uh, was pervasive. Pervasive. And so we come up to Donald Trump. And the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, I don't want to get into a lot of detail because we can easily talk about it and, and you have a lot of questions. I just want to lay this, this, this general uh, foundation. Populism, which has a long history in the United States, you go back to William Jennings Bryan, the prairie populism of the 19th century, uh, it was the kind of precursor to progressivism. I mean, in a way, progressivism is the, is the college-educated version of populism. It's the more sophisticated version of populism. Uh, but what you, what you really have had in the United States since the explosion of, fi of the financial markets uh, in the 2007-2008 financial crisis uh, is a new form of populism, an anti, a, a fierce anti-establishment populism that is still there, but in both parties. Uh, the Republican Party has been taken over by somebody who calls himself and, and acts like and wants to think of himself as a populist, but is clearly a Trojan horse uh, for the most establishment part of the establishment. I mean, uh, Trump's tax cut, his regulatory rollbacks, everything he actually does is for the very, very wealthy. Uh, but he has managed to evince through his personality, through being politically incorrect, uh, through acting like a wise guy, uh, through poking it to the establishment. He's managed to convince a lot of the, uh, not just the white working class, but a lot of others as well, that he is of them. He is a, sort of a working class person himself. Uh, and, and then you have Joe Biden, who, is working class, genuinely working class. Um, but he also has spent much of the last 50 years in government. I think quite candidly, that may be his biggest problem. Because when I think of the fierce anger 
that is anti-establishment anger. Uh, I worry that Trump will continue to put on an, an act and that Biden will not be able to show and reveal his genuine working class, uh, not just his, his credits, but his, his, his genuine uh, values, his genuine feelings, his genuine understanding uh, of, of where people are and what people need. Uh, so this election is not at all about, we like to think it's about issues. Uh, we like to think it's about, you know, on the one hand, abortion or, or abortion rights or gay rights or, or law and order or, uh, or immigrants or anything like that. It's not, it's not. Mm -hmm. This election is uh, and, and could be the final chapter uh, in the story that I've laid out for you over the last 50 years. Uh, it is, uh, in the way I think about it, a, a reflection of what I think of as the deepest political divide in the country right now uh, that transcends Republican versus Democrat and everything else we've talked about. It really is democracy versus oligarchy. Uh, oligarchy used in the classic Greek sense. That is, you have uh, extraordinary wealth in the hands of very few people, uh, and they are using that wealth for political purposes. Uh, that's what an oligarchy is, that's what it was. And our democracy is imperiled. That's what my last book really is about. Um, and I don't mean to blame anybody. Uh, this is the system. This is why I entitled the book The System, because it's about the system. It's about how the system has evolved. When you have that much money in the hands of that few, inevitably, inevitably, invariably, you undermine democracy in some way. As, as the great jurist, the great justice Louis Brandeis once said, we have a choice. We can either have great wealth in the hands of a few, or we can have a democracy, but we can't have both. Now he was talking about, and, and he was speaking uh, in the shadow of the first Gilded Age. Well, we're in a second Gilded Age, uh, but his words are equally relevant. So I'm gonna stop right there and thank you again for your patience. And thank you all of you, Su Yin and Rochelle and Arlie obviously, and Merrill and Andy uh, for, uh, for inviting me and turn it over to, over to Meryl. You, you, Meryl, you have some questions, I hope. I do, or the, the, the audience has many. Um, I've tried to group them by topic, and I've, I'm separating them in ways that obscure who asked the question. So sorry to those of you um, whose names will not be mentioned, and also to anybody who asks a question that doesn't get attended to. So let me start with um, several questions about the economy. I mean, you are an economist, um, inequities, and so on. Um, first, uh, someone read the RAND report and was disappointed that it focused on wage gap rather than purchasing power and quality of life. How should we think about the latter, purchasing power and quality of life? Well, ultimately, uh, it is all about quality of life. Uh, purchasing power does tell us something about quality of life, but not all. I mean, those of us who have been in the Bay Area over the last three weeks trying to breathe and knows that purchasing power has a little bit to do with how our quality of life is affected, but there are many other important issues, many of them having to, de to, uh, having to do with public goods. Uh, the, uh, the RAND report and measures of well-being uh, are always flawed. I mean, we, we don't really know how to measure well-being in this country. Uh, too often, to my way of thinking, we look at only economic growth uh, or we look at the stock market, uh, both of which are far less important than the median wage uh, or jobs uh, or uh, how many hours people have to put in or how much job security people have. I think those are all uh, much more important. So uh, we're limited in terms of the data we have, but I think that the RAND report does a pretty good job. Okay. Um, 
how can we compensate for the unfairness of redlining in real estate, which gave whites, so this is a, a what we all say, gave whites wealth that could be transferred to the next generation while blacks were systematically denied this opportunity? Uh, how can we compensate? Well, well, there are a number of very important conversations going on um, now and have been going on for a number of years, but I think they're getting larger and larger in terms of the number of people who are involved in the discussions about some sort of restitution, some sort of uh, reckoning uh, that we as white Americans uh, really have got to acknowledge and uh, do more than acknowledge, uh, actually maybe sacrifice uh, in order to reflect uh, the enormous burdens that Black Americans have suffered, uh, financial burdens, I mean, uh, specific economic burdens. It's redlining, it's, it's the, uh, all of the uh, covenants that used to be inside real estate deals. Uh, it's, uh, it's the legacy of redlining that even today, uh, it's hard, much harder for a Black person uh, to get a mortgage at the same terms as a white person. Uh, you know, I, in the research I did for my most recent book, uh, where I really looked in close detail at, at J.P. Morgan Chase, this biggest bank in the United States. Uh, well, they, until very recently, in fact, it may be that they still are, the Justice Department under Obama did crack down on them, but they were effectively dis discriminating on the basis of race in terms of the mortgage rates that people, that they would, they would give people. So we have a system that has basically penalized in a big way generations of black people because the home is where wealth has been stored for most people. That is the most important source of intergenerational transfer of wealth. Homes, houses, uh, and that's where black people have been most discriminated against over the last, well, it's not just since redlining, it goes all the way back before the founding of the Republic. Um, I'm just overwhelmed here by the number of questions and the variety of questions. Um, I'm going to jump around, so uh, I apologize for that. There's several questions that have to do with, um, phrased differently, about rationality and irrationality in politics, about ways to bridge the cultural divide about the diversity of beliefs and the, the, the political and cultural divide that we're in. Do you have comments about ways forward given this divide? Uh, well, the divide, first of all, let's stipulate, the divide is not going away with the election, uh, regardless of the outcome of the election. Uh, if Donald Trump wins, I think a very large portion of the electorate will not regard him as a legitimate president. Regardless of whether what happens to the Electoral College or the popular vote, uh, I think given everything that has happened so far uh, with, uh, well, you just name it, the Justice Department, the Post Office, uh, I mean, uh, how will people ever uh, give him the legitimacy that a president needs to have in order to be a president? Uh, and if he loses, uh, his followers will continue uh, to view him as the leader and as uh, somebody who is illegitimately uh, denied the presidency. So we, we are faced with uh, years and years, potentially, of a very deep divide. And if you follow my logic, the divide is not over Donald Trump himself. That's the current manifestation of the divide. The divide is a deeper divide. It is cultural and it is economic. And it is that place where culture and sociology and economics all interact in very dynamic ways. Uh, we have a, an economy that is not working for all. And to me, the most important question is how can we make it work for all and how can we make democracy work? And the two questions are very closely allied because there's no way we can make the economy work for all unless we make democracy work because democracy is the vehicle through which changes are going to be made that in turn make the economy work for all. Uh, I could get into a very wonky discussion with you about the kinds of economic changes that I think are important, but that's beside the point because none of those changes will occur unless we get big money out of politics and restore 
our democracy to some sort of a responsive uh, system, responsive to the needs and wants and, and ideals of most people. Um, uh, let me, uh, you know, there's so many aspects to this and I want to get to other questions and I know you have so okay. many, but let me also, uh, yeah, say, uh, I want to say one more thing. Um, and, and, and Arlie and I have spent a lot of time talking about this. Uh, there are ways of talking and communicating, engaging people on the opposite side of the great barrier, the great cultural barrier. Um, uh, for example, I, the other day I, I had a conversation with a Trump supporter. I, I, I suspected he was a Trump supporter. We didn't start talking politics, and this is the key. We started talking about kitchen table economics. Uh, I asked him, how's the job going? And he said, oh, it's okay. And then we got into uh, deeper and deeper into his job and his boss and, and he started confiding with in me and I started confiding in him some of the things about my job and, and you know, the university. And, and we got into, a, 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 we, we found a common ground in terms of our own sense of, of our own gripes, you know, our own sort of, uh, uh, you know, irritants, not big first class year, but, but stuff that we, we were upset about. And he was, he was upset about the cost of college for his kid. And, and then gradually, uh, over 15 or 20 minutes, uh, we, the conversation went to larger questions of, of, of politics, but, but policy and politics. Uh, we didn't get to the big questions of, democracy, of Democrats versus Republicans or Donald Trump or Biden until the very end. Um, and even that was sort of uh, not as important as the ground we covered. There was a lot of common ground. I think that's the important point. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are the kinds of conversations we need to have desperately. Uh, all right, enough said. Yes, um, well, again, I'm just overwhelmed here. Um, I, I'm gonna ask a provocative question that sort of plays into the conversation that you had. Has Trump done anything right? Um, well, that is a provocative question. Um, I think that um, I, I like the fact that he got a few Middle Eastern nations together with Israel. I thought that was a, a step in the right direction. I don't know quite how he did it. And I don't, you know, I certainly don't appro approve of, of selling all of that war uh, material and, and weapons to Saudi Arabia. I think that is, and what's happening in Yemen. I think, you know, we are war criminals in my mind in that regard. But, but, but in terms of beginning a little bit of a positive process there, maybe. Uh, what else can I say? I think um, he has, uh, one thing he's done is he's, he's, he's galvanized a lot of young people. Uh, like AOC, uh, and 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 brought a whole new generation of young people into politics. I'm not sure. I think they were trending in that direction a little bit before Trump, but Trump kind of was the last straw. And I think that uh, they they uh, I see so many people, uh, young people, people of of color, who are actually taking politics very seriously. Uh, as uh, and and that's. I, it's it's kind of awkward to credit Donald Trump with this, but in a way you did it right. You know, I mean, we may look back on it and say, "Boy, good good going, Trump." One of our participants mentions that he signed the Autism Care Act last year. Just another. Uh, yes. Good. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> um, maybe I'll ask one more question about economics and then shift to some other topics. Uh, what is your long term vision if um, if the candidates of your choice were elected and there is a shift in representation in Washington, what next? What's well, the let, me, let me just tell you a little bit about my experience, which will, under, which, which will give a foundation to what I'm about to say. Um, my experience in Washington, and I've worked there in the, in the, in the uh, Ford administration, the Carter administration, and the, and the Clinton administration, is that you can have the best people in Washington with the best values elected to office, and they appoint people uh, who you, you, you approve of, but it doesn't matter. Unless good people outside Washington are pushing hard, are mobilized and energized and organized to push 
those people inside, nothing good is going to happen because the status quo uh, is is not a status quo. Uh, the the powers of, uh, of of regression of the moneyed interests are so huge that you you have to have everybody else pushing very very hard. So even if we you know my my candidate of choice and I respect. Other people may have different candidates. My candidate of choice is Joe Biden. Uh, and uh, my hope is that uh, we have both the House and the Senate Democratic. But is that the end of it? No, that's the beginning. That, that is just, not, I know, <laughs> if that's all we get, that's the, the, there's nothing will happen uh, or almost nothing will happen. Maybe a few good things will happen, but uh, in, my, in my value, in my, in my constellation of good things, uh, no, uh, what will, must happen in terms of getting big money out of politics, uh, in terms of uh, making sure our democracy is working, uh, in terms of uh, the kind of healthcare system I think we need, uh, which I believe is a single payer system, uh, in terms of uh, working to fight climate change and create a lot of jobs in the process, uh, in terms of uh, fighting against police brutality and a racist system in so many systemic ways, and I could go on and on. No, none of this is going to happen just because there's a Democratic House and Senate and Joe Biden is there. Nothing will go happen good automatically. It all requires uh, good people to work very diligently, very hard, and never give up. I'm going to ask a question about the executive branch and then segue from there to the Supreme Court. Um, the checks and balances on the executive branch seem grossly insufficient during this presidency. Beside the continual legal challenges that take forever to work their way through the courts, what changes can be made to quell executive overreach, overreach and how can they be instituted? Well, there is a certain pendulum operating in American politics be among the branches. And you certainly saw after the executive overreach by Richard Nixon uh, that Congress enacted a whole bunch of, uh, of, of guardrails, if you will. Uh, now, those guardrails have all been rammed through by Donald Trump. I mean, look at the inspectors general. Inspect the whole idea of inspectors general in the departments came out of Watergate. And the, it was part of the Watergate reforms. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, Donald Trump fires the inspector general that he doesn't like. Uh, there is no guardrail that is high enough or strong enough for somebody who doesn't care about the institutions of government. Uh, and I think that uh, that means that we all have got to be advocates for, and it's kind of hokey, uh, it almost sounds Frank Capra-esque, but I think we all have to be advocates for institutionalism, for, uh, for, period, for people who will uh, be guarding the institutions of democracy. And now, there's going to be a great temptation if Joe Biden is elected and the House and the Senate uh, go democratic. There's going to be a great temptation uh, if the Supreme Court uh, looks like it's going to go in the direction of six uh, Republican appointees, six conservatives, uh, three of them appointed by Donald Trump. There's going to be a great temptation uh, on uh, Joe Biden and the Democrats to expand the number of Supreme Court justices. Um, now, I'm of two minds about that. I can understand completely why that might be, might feel appropriate. I mean, after all, uh, you've got uh, a, a Supreme Court uh, that doesn't represent in any way, shape, or form. Uh, where most of the people, most of the public is. Uh, but is that really the right thing to do in terms of maintaining the institutional credibility of the, of our government? I don't know. Uh, Lincoln, for those of you who are historians, may remember that um, Lincoln added a 10th Supreme Court justice. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, was very serious about adding uh, one or two additional justices until um, one justice switched sides. You remember that? The switch in time that saved the nine? Mm -hmm. um, actually, his name was Justice Roberts, a, a former Justice Roberts. Uh, and historians have him wrong. He, it, 
the, the, the historical view is that he switched sides in order to preserve the nine justices on the Supreme Court uh, and, and not have court packing um, by, by Roosevelt. Actually, it turns out that he decided to switch sides before the court packing scheme actually became known. Uh, so um, it was not, uh, he didn't switch to save the nine. Uh, but my point is that institutionalism and the institutional integrity and respect for our institutions of government is very, very important. We have time for another question or two, Meryl. Okay. Um, we'll have to, you actually answered one of the questions about Supreme Court, a couple labor questions. One is your view about the future of unions and not exactly related, but potentially related. Um, your, uh, should the U.S. have labor tariffs to protect American workers from job, job losses due to starvation wages in poor countries? So two somewhat related labor questions. Well, let me um, start with the first, because um, I'm surprised that I didn't get the following question. And the following, and the, <laughs> the question is, why? You may have, but I missed it. <laughs> okay. Let me ask the question and then incorporate the question about that you, that you just asked me into my answer. The question I expected was, why is it that from the end of the Second World War until the late 70s, the median wage kept on rising in tandem with the growth of the economy? And then we saw this tremendous change in the late 70s, and early 1980s, uh, to stagnant wages, even though the economy kept on growing. What was, the, what was the key change? What happened? Well, part of the answer has to do with labor unions. Uh, because it was uh, around the late 70s and early 1980s that corporate America decided to start busting unions, to go really uh, after unions, to, to get rid of unions, uh, to uh, enact legislation in certain states that would be anti-union, uh, uh, and, um, and, and, and actually move into those states, move the entire companies into those states. Now, uh, that be, in the 1950s and 1960s, about a third of the entire private sector workforce was unionized. Uh, Thirty-five percent. That was enough uh, to give workers a, a very major say uh, over wages and benefits, uh, and to affect the non-unionized sector of the workforce as well. Because you had a lot of uh, CEOs who knew that if they didn't go along with prevailing wages and the prevailing uh, agreements, they would be unionized next. Uh, so those. Union agreements, uh, starting with the Treaty of Detroit in the early 50s, extending right through the 60s uh, and early 70s, those really did um, give workers uh, a share of the gains in a very profound way. Uh, and then you had this reaction set in. Why did companies start busting unions? Why was it acceptable suddenly uh, to take on unions? I think the biggest factor was the rise of the corporate raider in the late 70s, early 1980s. Mike Milken, for example, uh, or uh, what are some of the other names? They're still around. Uh, many of these people uh, still turn up, you know, like bad pennies. Uh, they, they convinced uh, the Reagan administration, it started under the Carter administration. Uh, Jimmy Carter didn't pay much attention. Stu Eisenstadt didn't pay much attention. Uh, but under Reagan, uh, the Reagan administration began to notice uh, there was a lot of ferment uh, in Congress to try to stop this because uh, a lot of people knew that the once you started allowing corporate raiders to demand maximizing shareholder returns, that the social costs in terms of abandoned communities uh, and workers replaced by machinery or outsourcing abroad would be enormous. Um, uh, but the Reagan administration uh, blessed it. Uh, 
uh, and there were, was academic research behind it that celebrated uh, some economists, particularly Harvard Business School, celebrated efficiency. They said, oh, well, this is the way we become more efficient, more competitive as a nation. Well, yes, but rubbish, really. Uh, um, that was the, really the start of the great split between productivity gains and economic gains on the one hand and stagnant wages on the other. Uh, the demise of labor unions, I said that over a third of American workers were unionized uh, in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. Today, the percentage of private sector workers unionized is 6.5%. Down from 35% to 6.2%, there is no factor that is as significant, in my view, in explaining what happened to the median wage as the demise of labor unions. Now, uh, Merrill, we are just about out of town time, and I don't want to take any more time than we are allowed or allotted. Okay, well, thank you so much. And please, those of you who asked questions that I uh, was unable to attend to or Robert was unable to respond to, apologies. Thank, thank you so yeah, much. But, but Meryl, let me just end on an upbeat note, may I? Oh, yeah, you will. Yeah. There have been quite a few people actually are asking, can, can you provide us some options? Yes, I, well, I, that's what I want to do my final, in my final minute. Let me, let me give you some, some optimism. One source of optimism is history, because I've made several allusions in my talk to the Gilded Age of the late 19th century. Well, what preceded and followed the Gilded Age was the populist and the progressive era. That progressive era was very important. Teddy Roosevelt led the charge but many were behind him uh, to rectify the inequalities and corruption and bribery uh, and poverty and conspicuous consumption of the Gilded Age. Uh, and the public did rise up. Uh, Anti-monopoly, antitrust laws, food and pure food and drug laws, a progressive income tax, and we could go on and on. And then Teddy Roosevelt's fifth cousin, Franklin D. Roosevelt continued uh, in the 1930s you know, under different circumstances, grant you, granted. Uh, but uh, that's cause for the whole period, the progressive period, right through the New Deal, uh, as a reaction against the, the excesses of uh, the Gilded Age, America's resilience, the, the, the outrage of the public expressed itself in po political terms. I think it's possible that that might come again. Uh, the public is, is outraged to that extent. Uh, the second thing that gives me optimism is young people. Now, for the last 43 years, I have taught uh, in universities, uh, wonderful universities, uh, but I've seen changes. This generation of young people I'm now teaching, and it's not just at Berkeley, and I love you, Cal Berkeley. It's the best place I've ever taught. Uh, but I also guest teach at other places around the country. This generation right now is more committed to positive social change, more dedicated to public service in that pursuit than any generation I've ever encountered before in my, my 43 years of teaching. That gives me huge encouragement. And finally, I look at... The young people and not so young people who are getting engaged in politics, the diversity, uh, the, uh, the, the women, uh, uh, the, the very, very activist young people, black and, and people of color, uh, Hispanic, Latinx, and I'm, I'm overwhelmed with appreciation and optimism. That's the future. Demographically, that's the future. Uh, nobody can take away that demographic reality. That's where we're heading. Uh, and so for all of those reasons, and not the least, I should add a number four, what alternative do we have, honestly, but to hope for the best. So on that positive note, thank you all. Uh, and I really appreciate your time and attention. Thank, thank you, you so much, Robert. Thank you so much, Robert. Yes, and thank you all so much for joining us for this very illuminating presentation.
At the peak of the presentation, we had 506 people, uh, six presenters and 500 guests. Unfortunately, the last minute deluge of you out there had us reach our limit and an unknown number of others were turned away. So I just want you to know and to let others know the presentation will be available on our YouTube page, which can be found at the top of the Ashby Village website. And I want to just mention, as I mentioned earlier, presentations like this are made possible by the generous donations of participants like you. So please click the donate link in the chat box or go to ashbyvillage.org at any time. And please consider making this a monthly gift. During this pandemic, Ashbury Village has been achieving its mission of keeping members engaged and sustained in their own homes, which is more important now than ever. Our online program is thriving and we've had been maintaining essential one-on-one -on -one services, including grocery and medication deliveries, weekly phone call check-ins, virtual tech support, and transportation to doctors. Since Shelter in Place began, we have provided nearly 1,400 personal services. So for any of you out there that want a community or need support, please consider joining us as a member, a volunteer, or a donor. You can find out more on our website or give us a call. So with that, I wanna thank Robert again and all of you for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you.